what's your advice to somebody who's trying to lose weight, um, but in a sustainable way? So not like in some ways when bodybuilders are doing it, it's not really sustainable because they're really starving themselves down to a competition. Yeah. And the way that they're eating during that period of time is, you know, it's, it's so catabolic um, that that they're destroying their endocrine system along the way, but it's short lived and they're going to refeed when they're done. And, and so while we can talk about all of the different things that they, they might stack and do all simultaneously, um, you know, what's your view on the sustainable way to lose 10 pounds and keep it off in terms of deficit? I think your perception of what bodybuilders do as far as aggression towards their diet is on hinged on their final outcome and how steep it is to get there cumulatively but the way they arrive there no one is more mindful of preserving tissue than bodybuilders so, so in other words they're not the, dram they're not creating huge deficits at any one point eventually in time. they are at the point that they absolutely need to but they're more careful than any human i know oh yeah and i would i would believe so that. if you were to try and take away from a bodybuilder how would i apply this when they're stepping on stage at literally dice to the socks 5% body fat, it's not that you're getting there, it's that you're stopping at like the eight week out from competition mark of a bodybuilder, maybe not eight, maybe like 10 or 12, but the process they took to get even there was very staggered, calculated, yeah. they would not reduce. And by the way, 10 to 12 weeks out, what's their body fat relative to that five they're gonna step on stage? Like it depends at what level and how on track they are, but yep. some of them are starting at like, you know, 12% body fat. So perhaps that's not, you know, everyone has different goals of what they consider good. So yeah, yeah. maybe this is like my skewed fitness perception saying 10 week out bodybuilders, what you should shoot for. But just in general, the process they take to get from their peak body fat percentage to stage lean, no one is more mindful of titrating accordingly the macronutrient and micronutrient input to sustain training volume too because they need to actually make sure their training doesn't deteriorate because if it does they're going to lose tissue so yeah taking from that you see them at least hitting one gram per pound body weight in protein like without fail and they will hold that until the stage unless there is some like maybe on the week of they're already at their target body fat and then at that point, they're trying to do tactics to make their stomach as, you know, not full of anything as possible. So what they do on the last week doesn't really count. Okay, up, okay. And, up until a week out. Up yeah. until a week out, they would still be taking one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Typically. And to your point, at this point, you can't be doing that with steaks because there's it's way too caloric. So you are on the chicken breast protein powders depending on the person though and i guess it depends on again the quality of your meat because it's like i've seen the macros on your venison and it's, yeah, it's basically insane. just protein yeah yeah so um basically the staggered approach you want to take is that you don't really want to lose more than i think typically it's like one percent of your body weight per week is a general rule of thumb which is i guess could be depending how obese you are, could be a little bit aggressive, but even let's just say a pound a week maybe yeah. is like maybe a more reasonable target. Yeah. But in general, if you are, and this is kind of a perhaps a more applicable cookie cutter recommendation, one gram per pound of body weight, which I think everyone would essentially agree with in a deficit to sustain um, tissue, lean tissue, muscle mass. Then from there, you want to be whatever your maintenance calories is, which is you know, it might take a little bit of finagling to figure out what this is when you've never done it before, but there are calculators online that roughly ballpark give you what will be plus minus 300 or calories or something of what it takes to stably hold your body weight for, um, like if you ate that diet, it wouldn't go up or down. What I do typically is I take that number and I say, use your exact diet for a week with this calorie amount, like this is your diet model and this is your totally calorie goal for the day, eat exactly this every day and then see what the average is at the end of the week because just going by daily fluctuations could be wildly different. You might jump up or down based on water, based on food volume, based on if you took a dump or not. By the way, when do bodybuilders come off creatine? They don't. They'll they take used, creatine to the stage. Yeah, they used to think you should come off because it's bloating, but, and I'm sure Lane would tell you the same. But most of the water weight is in the muscle. Yeah, like it, it is helpful for cosmetic appearance Got and it. for sustaining training uh, 
performance. Got it. Okay. So it's anti-catabolic. Interestingly enough, it's one of the only natural compounds that may inhibit myostatin too. So it has that upside. Um, and it's like all the things it does from a neurological standpoint, perhaps fertility. It's even used for depression now in women at like 10 plus grams or something, which is crazy. So a lot of use cases are coming out, but overall, we all know it works for muscle, um, for performance in the gym, as well as volumizing the muscle. Would you, would you say creatine is hands down the best over-the-counter supplement for performance? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would be superior. Depending on your sport, though, because if you're yes, if, yeah. if weight is everything, yeah, if yeah. you're a cyclist or a runner, you pro you the negative the downside of the extra five pounds of lean mass is perhaps yeah probably yeah. not family. but um so yeah um making sure you're getting your you know you have some sort of number you're going to adhere to and you know how to measure every day which basically is just reading every nutritional label you have and becoming intimately aware of what you're ingesting if you put something in your mouth you count it regardless if it's a sauce regardless if it's a drink regardless if it's a lick like you you count that shit and do, do most bodybuilders use like an app to do this or can they just keep track in their head after a while after a while they are so in tune with it you can look at a piece of meat know how much it's going to shrink after cooking know how much um, how many ounces it is how much that equates to in protein uh calories like everyone at a high level eventually you become it becomes so ingrained that you don't even need to track it because you can literally look at it maybe you'll keep the calorie count and the protein count, but you know what you're looking at and you can just write it down quick. You don't have to go look up and cross reference, you know, on my fitness pal, what is a chicken breast, one yeah. ounce cooked equal. So you can at least look forward to, even though it's cumbersome and arduous at the start, eventually it becomes so, so habitual, you'll just know it. So you have a target calorie amount and you eat that every day for a week and you see if your weight goes up or down. And if it goes up, you know, you're eating a bit too much. If it goes down, you know you're in a deficit and you decide from there, is the weight loss too fast? If you lost three pounds in a week, perhaps it's too fast and you wanna kind of like titrate it back up a little bit. But ultimately you can kind of shoot for, once you know your maintenance, some amount of calories where you're dropping, you know, 300 I feel like is a good deficit to start at. Because ideally, and this is kind of the whole general approach without getting way too boring for everyone, is you want to keep your protein where it needs to be, which is a gram per pound. You want to have enough carbs to fuel performance, which depending on what sport you're doing can vary, but without getting too complicated, a good split a lot of people follow is 40% protein, 40% carbs, 20% fat. And this is kind of like a ratio that allows you to sustain uh, hormone production and have some amount of fat that supports it, um, carbs for some level of gym performance, and then protein for hopefully hitting your goals. And it'll depend on the person and modulate accordingly. But that's just a general framework people can start with and you can... So that's a pretty low fat diet. Ish. Yeah. You would... T t the fat and the protein would typically stay around neutral and you would typically lower the carbs accordingly depending on how intensive your exercise regimen and sport is. But in general, I feel like that's like a minimum amount of fat that would be like no lower than that is kind of what I'm saying. So, yeah. And and what are some of the concessions a person has to make to get that low in fat? Like, I don't, I think I'm probably literally the last time I tracked my macros, I was almost exactly one third, one third, one third between the three. Hmm. Um, in general, when and I didn't, were, and I didn't feel like I was like eating a ton of fat, right? It was just typically when you are eating meat, you will achieve the majority of that through the fat content of your meats. And it will depend how lean of the cuts you are getting, how many eggs you are eating at the time. But I'm just thinking like you know, the, the olive oil on the salad and stuff like that. Yeah. But I guess that's like, you know, they're, they're just cutting that out. Yeah. Like olive oil on a salad is, uh, one of the first things I would be looking at as you probably just added what 200 to 300 calories to a big salad for sure if not more yeah so unless you're Brian Johnson or willing to get like 25 percent of your calories from oil um probably not a bodybuilding conducive uh macro allotment because it's like it's not even though fat is satiating it's nine calories yeah per gram so where do, where do bodybuilders get the majority of their fiber typically it will be through veggies if they're having them and those are going to be proportionally lower calories i suppose but oftentimes fiber is not 
Um, I don't know. Some of them use like supplements too, like psyllium husk. But I'm not to say that I don't want to get into like a fiber debate necessarily because <laughs> I don't even know like what the actual answer is there. But in general, bodybuilders aren't really paying. Right. They're not optimizing for health. If we believe fiber is healthy, they're yeah, optimizing. And I'm not saying neglect it. Like I think that it is important, but I don't think that. I, I'm certainly not saying remove your fiber in order to achieve your deficit. I'm, I'm just saying that you can proportionally get to your goals almost certainly by modulating carb intake essentially exclusively, typically. And that's going to be in the form of starchy carbs then. Yeah, and like you can modulate the type of foods you're eating too to accommodate the satiety is ultimately the takeaway like from me, because when it comes to actually describing the nutritional literature, I hate it as much as you, dude. It's not like something I like to talk about. Oh, how much fiber should you keep in? Like, I, I don't know, man, like a decent amount, <laughs> like some, but enough that you can go to the washroom properly and it's, you know, some healthy amount. But ultimately what I've seen in the bodybuilding space is modulating carbs up and down accordingly based on needs in the gym and protein stays at an amount that is anti-catabolic or conducive to muscle protein synthesis in a surplus fat is some amount that at least supports steroid hormone production as much as you can tolerate and then carbs is like the most performance enhancing macro in terms of actually driving your performance outcomes in the gym volumizing the muscle having glycogen topped out etc and from there i i would typically recommend a 300 deficit and literally milk that as many and up in that week prior to show how mm -hmm. many calories is a bodybuilder typically down to if they're stage ready and they're natural and like sub 200 pounds like they might be down to you know below 2000 calories potentially if they're a top ifbb professional mr olympia competitor who weighs 260 you know they could be at 2500 2600 it kind of depends on the person which is interesting for many people listening that sounds like a lot of calories still but you're saying given how big they are and that they're still training pretty hard that's yeah a, that's a pretty big deficit it also depends how much they're willing to lean into cardio because some guys will actually prefer to just diet themselves into the body fat and not do any cardio because they just don't like it wouldn't recommend that though because one thing i have learned over the years is from a nutrient partitioning standpoint actually moving when you're eating is going to produce a better body composition typically than trying to just diet the whole deficit mm. so what we see even in like the ifbb with these top bodybuilders who are trying to not get fat as they eat exorbitant amounts of food and they're on insulin and hgh and huge amounts of anabolics they are doing things like going for walks after they eat their meal, which is more potent than metformin at controlling blood glucose. Like they're actually making sure they are moving around and actually shuttling nutrients as much as they can, even outside of the gym. Some are lazy and don't do that, but the ones that are trying to make the most use of maximizing the calories. I see. So the, the mobilization doesn't require that you, you know, you're clearly not going to oxidize everything you ate. Like if they just ate 800 calories, they're not going to burn 800 calories on a walk of any duration, but just getting out there and walking, you're saying leads to better fuel partitioning. Seemingly. Yeah. Interesting. And I think that is, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I've certainly anecdotally noticed the improvement in blood sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, uh, even for stabilization of like energy levels too, like making sure you're not hanging out on a couch with your spiked blood glucose seems to be pretty impactful, not just for mental performance, but also for, uh, you know, partitioning and actually optimizing body composition too. So, and that's in enhanced ranks at guys eating exorbitant amounts. But anyways, back to the layman in general, you're in a 300 deficit. You kind of milk that for all you can. And by that, I mean, the biggest problem, and I guess one of the biggest takeaways from this whole discussion could be that the people who aggressively cut way too fast will end up losing more weight off the bat, but they will end up in a state of adaption faster, whereby you are basically going to not only expend less calories at rest via the depression of like non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is like fidgets and moving with just like your everyday activities, you will actually start to subconsciously do that less. In addition, you are pushing yourself to a state of nutrient deprivation much sooner than was necessary to achieve a fat loss outcome. So rather than trying to lose, you know, 
six pounds in two weeks, why don't I go with, you know, like one to two pounds at most and actually milk what I can out of that little t- tiny calorie increment before I decide, okay, do I need to then add some more cardio to my regimen or do I want to decrease food by another hundred calories or do I want to add, you know, metabolic enhancing pharmacology? You can actually make the call at that point because you've exhausted the actual increment and you know you're not mm-hmm. unnecessarily depressing hormone production and also putting yourself into a hole of what is essentially a malnourished state because if you push too hard and you go from let's just say you're eating 2800 calories a day and you instantly drop to 1800 yeah. you will lose a ton of weight off the rip and it, you'll think oh this is great and then very soon you will get to a point where it's like holy hell i am starving this is not sustainable what am i doing what do i do next i plateaued now and where do i go from here it becomes easy to dig yourself into a hole if you're not careful about this like titration down essentially so i typically recommend trying to milk what you can until weight loss has averaged out at neutral for at minimum a few days but typically a week and then from there because as a natural you are very susceptible to major aberrations and hormone suppression if you are going to deprive the hell out of nutrients and especially if you're doing huge amounts of cardio concurrently because you think that's what you need to be doing also don't put yourself in a hole on the energy expenditure side 